10 seconds early, but uh, let us start nevertheless. Um, it really gives me tremendous pleasure uh, to welcome Francis Solway here tonight, who I think for seven years has been Francis, I mean, CEO of Land Securities. Now, you know, we're always arguing about what's the biggest, what's the brightest. What's Land Securities is, is by most accounts the largest uh, real estate uh, company in Britain, and I should not be surprised if it wasn't true for Europe as well. Um, but for a very large company, it's surprisingly nimble on its feet and does a range of things. It was the, one of the very earliest British uh, real estate uh, investment trusts when that became possible. Um, it's a major manager and provider of building services. Uh, but of course, it's also one of Britain's most important uh, developers and has been responsible for some landmark buildings uh, in London and around uh, the UK. Um, and I'm particularly welcome to, uh, pleased to welcome Francis because for many reasons, but one of those reasons of course is that he's very kindly the chair of the advisory board for the Real Estate Economics and Finance Masters course that we run at LSE. Quite a few of you I recognise from that. Um, but he's also a, a sort of strategic, analytical, cerebral uh, uh, property person. Uh, indeed, he has um, uh, a track record in academia uh, and has published a, a, a quite significant study uh, on the, the real estate world. Uh, and also, finally, of course, because he doesn't know this, but he actually shares my passion which is for mountains and mountain walking. So I'm particularly uh, glad to welcome a fellow mountaineer to scale the development heights. Francis, uh, over to you. He's going to talk about 40 minutes, so, and then we'll have time for questions. Good evening. I want to start by going back to December 2008. So a couple of months after the collapse of Lehman's, which was, to put it mildly, a difficult time for business. And I was involved in the sort of debate that I'm sure many of you were involved in, and people asking the question, what is the social purpose of banks? And the normal reaction to that question is quite a long pause. And then somebody in the room came up with an extremely good and succinct answer, which is that the social purpose of banks is to provide liquidity for businesses and for us as private individuals. Now, Paul knows that for many years before the Lehman's crash, it was the property development industry that wasn't seen in too high a regard. So really, Paul is asking me, what is the social purpose of property development? but he's kind enough to express the question in a slightly more polite way, which is why the role of the developer matters. And to me, it's all about being the provider of the building infrastructure that allows growth. And that's growth of the economy and it's growth of the population in a country. And there are a number of different building blocks to that. One is providing the capital for new buildings because buildings are very capital intensive. Part of it is about just-in-time delivery, because you may want to move to a new house, or if you're a business, to a new office building, and say, I want it now. But it takes up to three years to build. It takes another one to three years in the planning stage. So we're doing a lot of forward planning for users of buildings. People expect buildings to work, to be fit for purpose. They expect them to be delivered on time. And there's quite a skill behind that. They also expect, when they go into a new building, that the infrastructure around it will be smart and shiny. The pavements aren't all broken. The drains work. We deal with all that stuff as well. Now, where the record is not so good is do we make a positive contribution to the built environment or not? I, are the buildings that we construct appealing or are they absolute horrors? And that I think is where our case is most difficult. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that. 
But my list then of why the role of the property developer matters is here. Now, you could say that's an over-serious list, and it misses out one or two things. If you think about property developers, you don't think about that list. You probably think about ego and money. So I'll try and make sure that I say a little bit about ego and money as well. And let's start with money and this point about source of capital. Here's an example of two FTSE 100 companies, both with a market capitalization of between four and five billion pounds. The company on the left is pretty asset light. It's got fixed assets of 700 million pounds. And despite having a market capitalization of four billion, it only has net assets of 100 million pounds. So it's lean and capital light. The company on the right hand side is capital intensive. 10 billion pounds of assets, 6 billion pounds of net assets after deducting the debt. Now those two companies are Land Securities and Next. And shareholders like companies to do what they say on the tin. So they like operational businesses to be asset light and to be focused on earnings growth. And they're quite happy to have a different sort of offer from a property business, which is all about being capital intensive. Now, my next point was about just-in-time delivery, when it takes you three years to demolish and then build a major new commercial building. And that's tough anyway to get your planning right over a three-year period. But when you're trying to do it in the sort of cyclical market that we have in London, and the blue lines are the movements in the value of office properties in London, you can see how difficult it is. Because each of those green horizontal lines is the three-year construction period. And I've shown each of them for an unfortunate developer who started development at the peak of the market and finished three years later. And you can see that in two of those cycles, he's basically dead because values have fallen by about 40%. And bearing in mind the debt he'll probably have had to support the development, there is literally no equity left. So development has real financial challenges. Now you could say, pick the, the difficult examples where somebody got it as wrong as they possibly could. But let's actually look over a very long time period, 25 years, 1983 to 2008. And here we look at income producing investment properties and developments, the returns over successive two year periods. And what attracts everybody to development is if we look at the upper quartile performance, which is the 75th percentile, you can see that the person who put money into a standing investment property got 17% return and the developer got 23. That's why people go to development like a honeypot. But if you go to the not so successful, the lower quartile, the 25th percentile column, you can see that in more difficult periods, the investment property just made a positive return, but the development lost money. But actually, the really scary column is the midpoint, the median, the 50th percentile. So what that is saying is for the mid-performing investment property and the mid-performing development, the development had a lower return. Well, development's more risky, so it should have higher returns. So it's basically saying people haven't been able to make the risk return and development work. Now those are market figures, just in case uh, I should put a caveat. For land securities, the figures are the other way around. So we have made more money on development than on investment. Uh, and in fact, it equates all very closely to our outperformance over a long period of time. But were you to be really clinical in looking at that midpoint, median 50th percentile, you would say that developers should all be sent to Gamblers Anonymous because they've taken on high-risk activity and they aren't getting the returns to compensate. So it certainly isn't an easy game. 
And an easier way, less numerically based, of expressing this is just to think about these four projects in the UK. Stocking Park, the leading business park by Heathrow Airport. Brindley Place, probably the most respected big office complex in a provincial city. And then two landmark schemes in London at the bottom. The one thing they have in common is that the first developer of each of those schemes, which are now seen as being successful in retrospect, went bankrupt. So delivering large development schemes is not easy at all. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time about those things that you probably take for granted, that people are able to deliver buildings that work and finish them when they say they're going to finish them. Here, you'll be pleased that you don't start study in the CV History Library in the University of Cambridge. It initially won architectural awards for a wonderful sloping glazed elevation, but the reality is heat gain, heat loss, leaks, and total inability to get between lectures um, at, on the hour because the staircases weren't sufficient. It is possible to get it wrong. And perhaps the most iconic building in the world, Sydney Opera House, started with a budget of seven million Australian dollars, due to complete in 1963, completed 10 years late, 15 times over budget. The Americans can get it wrong too, the big dig in Boston, tunnel under Boston city centre to alleviate traffic congestion, completed nine years late, five times over budget. Now you don't often hear about property developers being late and over budget, so there is a skill there that we do deliver for uh, businesses and others. But as I said, our Achilles heel is do we build <coughs> attractive buildings? And I think this one might even be in Kingsway. So and I was talking to Paul before about Kingsway not being the most attractive street. Well, that's one reason why not. But there is a reason, or there are logical reasons, why developers have a tendency to put up unattractive buildings. Although we don't even always succeed, our aim is to make money. One of the ways that you maximise profit is to get as much floor space as possible on a site. Hence the tendency to build too tall, not to allow any open spaces, not to allow those interesting little alleyways that cut through sites, because all of those take up lettable floor space. And Clearly, if profit is the difference between value and cost, there's a pressure down on cost. So you see repetitive designs like these elevations. You see use of cheap materials. And there is one other reason which can take developers to rather monotonous, boring buildings. And that is because in most instances, we don't know who's going to occupy the building. So we have to produce a very homogenous standard product. And it doesn't pay us to take big design risks, because we may find the only person who wants to, who's got a requirement to lease a building, is very conservative on design. So those are good reasons why developers sadly get pushed towards less satisfactory buildings. And part of it, perhaps, comes out of the dialogue between the planner and the developer, who I've unfairly called for the planner, Mr. No, and the developer, Mr. Square Foot. But let's imagine that this planning officer really doesn't give out very many planning consents. So there are very few new buildings being offered in the particular area. The developer will gain the position. Anything the developer can get will let up. So the developer will just get what he can. So, and the only exception to that, actually, is where ego is a good thing is developers do take some pride in the buildings they deliver. So actually, people will aspire to produce reasonably good buildings, even if they might be able to get away with less. Now you could say in that scenario, what if you abolish plan and you transfer the risk to the developer? You say to the developer, you've got to build good buildings because I'm going to allow so many to be built in this area, only the best will let up. And I have to say, I wouldn't advocate that because it might take a decade for the developer to understand the change rules of the game, and you then have a lot of unattractive buildings. But actually, in the City of London, we have a pretty good example of how you can get this relationship to work. 
If you were to walk around the City of London and look at every building, 50% of them have been built since 1985. Quite an amazing statistic. 1985 happened to be the year when the current head of planning at the City of London, called Peter Rees, took up his office. And his approach has been to support development, but to insist on high quality. So it's high volume, high quality development. What that means is the businesses in the City of London have been able to expand into efficient, attractive buildings, but there's been no asset inflation. So the supply demand bit has been managed very, very carefully because the City of London's main objective is to make the city an efficient place for financial services businesses. Um, and to have had no real inflation in rents in an area of a city like London is quite amazing. So that's an example of quality plus volume. Now, the other way in which you can try and encourage developers to go for quality is to give them very big sites. And the reason is because if when you start on a big site, you up the quality and you establish a higher level of value, that will flow through to the value of all the tens of acres you own and have yet to develop. So you create value that you reap the benefits of on a large site. So if you just have an infill site, you do a very high quality building, it's all the people around you benefit. If you've got a big site, you benefit. And the best example at the top is uh, the Duke of Grover, or his predecessors, in the 1700s in Mayfair. So an estate of 100 acres. But amazingly, I think we're going to have something similar happening in King's Cross. I think this will be the best development London has seen for a very long time. It will happen this decade, um, and it will provide a lot of infrastructure to an area that's been run down, and it will increase the values in that area. And what is quite amazing is the developer is called Argent, and they're one of the smaller property development companies around. So enormous skills to manage the upfront costs and to maintain quality standards. Now, there are other sites in London um, of similar scale. But one of the interesting things is, quite a lot of these big sites, they miss cycles. In fact, they don't miss one cycle, they miss two or three cycles. You've probably been looking at Battersea Power Station not looking like that, which is a developed scheme, but looking like a sad carcass for probably 20 years. And that sad carcass is now controlled by NAMA, the Irish Recovery Bank. It shows how difficult it is. But people don't give up with their aspirations. So we have the Olympic Legacy site, which everybody hopes will be a success, and we'll see how it goes. And we have Earl's Court. And sort of add credence to those earlier examples of big developments where the first developer went bankrupt, the planning application for the Earl's Court site, just the master plan, not the detailed design of buildings, cost £24 million. Pounds. So these are sums that for small developers, uh, if the planning doesn't work out, they literally can't afford to start again with a revised planning application. Now, I did a little bit of background reading uh, to prepare for this talk, and I, I was doing a bit of reading about urbanism and what people feel makes a difference to urban environments, what's aspirational. And some of the words that were used were pride, excellence, and individuality. And very occasionally, one can feel that those words are appropriate. I'm not saying they are for this scheme, but we own a site of just under three acres, right by St Paul's Cathedral. And we wanted to put up a totally modern building, which actually has grabbed the imagination of Londoners. But we knew that we had to aspire for excellence and individuality in that location. So we looked internationally for the appointment of the architect. We knew that the views would be contentious, from uh, the uh, councillors in the city 
right up to, I think, royalty, it's fair to say. So we also um, set up an architectural selection committee on which we were the minority. Quite brave to deliver a 500 million pound development when you put yourself in the minority uh, on the architectural selection committee. But we had a confidence in our ability to manage architects to deliver schemes. Um, and we have been rewarded with a scheme that is quite special and has captured people's imagination. Other words that I found in, in, in the literature were places where people can interact and places where people can relax. So here, not very far actually from here, through there in Hoban, uh, we built a new complex and we created a new square. And our ambition was to create somewhere where people can relax and where they can come together for special events. And it, it has been successful. Now, I want to stand back from buildings for a bit and go to a sort of national perspective about raison d'etre of development. Because it really does make a difference to your approach as to whether you are developing to accommodate a rapidly growing town or city or whether you're involved in regeneration. And I'm going to look historically and internationally to give you a feel for the differences between the two. These are population growth statistics for Victorian Britain, and those are growth figures per decade. Enormously strong population growth. Interestingly, greater in the cities than from the country as a whole. So there was a process of urbanization, movement of people from rural areas to cities. You update that now to the UK and to London, and much lower levels of growth, but actually probably higher than you might have imagined. We think London's quite a static place. It really isn't. It's continued to grow at quite a rate, and you'd have to question whether the planning system's been able to accommodate that growth. So for London, a bit about growth, a bit about regeneration. And then we go to the States, where higher levels of national growth in <coughs> population with strong immigration flows, but those immigration flows increasingly going not to the historic cities on the East Coast, but to um, southern states. China, high population growth, but nothing like Victorian Britain for the country as a whole, but massive urbanization, movement of population from rural areas to cities. And India, pretty evenly spread um, population growth everywhere, rural and cities. And if I reflect on those figures and then think what is happening at the moment in Africa, where there's quite a lot of growth in population, but you could say in Africa the property development industry is failing to keep pace with this population growth and we're getting a lot of shanty towns. And I was told recently, in fact, I came to a lecture here, where I learned that in non-agricultural employment in Africa, about 80% of the employment is what's called informal. That probably means people aren't paying taxes. And this is a negative spiral, because what it means is that growth in population is not contributing to taxes to pay for the infrastructure that is needed to allow more growth. And when you compare that to Victorian Britain, developers must have been remarkably successful because, of course, we're still using the infrastructure of Victorian Britain and it was sufficient to allow that growth to go on and on and on. But London, I think we are much more about regeneration. And I think you could ask, why, if it's just regeneration, is it an enabler of economic growth? And there are a number of reasons. Business products evolve. So to maximize economic growth, you've got to provide buildings that serve the new growing economic activities. When I started work in the City of London in the 1970s, there were fur trade warehouses in the city, happily now obsolete, I think, and I even worked in a tea packing warehouse in the City of London. 
Those uses shouldn't happen there. Redevelopment, regeneration is needed. Business models evolve. The most efficient form of transport changes, so businesses want to cluster around different transport nodes. Size of enterprise with globalisation. Commercial organisations are now massively bigger. And one of our challenges is, how do you fit the headquarters for a major global organisation within the historic context of a city like London? So size is pretty challenging. The infrastructure requires renewal, as I've said, and as I think will happen very successfully at King's Cross. War damage I'm going to come back to. Um, green agenda, very clear cut. 44% of carbon emissions in the UK come from buildings. Within that, 19% from commercial buildings. There is no foreseeable way that we're going to be able to hit carbon reduction targets from minor upgrades to existing buildings. Major refurbishment and redevelopment is essential to begin to get um, buildings that can serve, that, that, that use less energy. Now, war damage is interesting. When I walk around London, I think there's a lot of new building happening. When I go to Paris, I think there's really very little. It feels quite a museum-like city. To my greatest surprise, if I go to New York, I often think now it feels quite an old city with lot, not, not a lot of new building. What probably has enabled London to have cycles of redevelopment is sadly the war damage with big areas of several acres at a time fully demolished. And those buildings were rebuilt when there were very limited resources in the 50s and 60s, rebuilt cheaply, perhaps unattractively. They now give the scope for rebuilding to a higher standard. And again, one new change is perhaps an example of that. That bomb site didn't start rebuilding till about 1953, 1955, and it was to create the building top right, which was an overflow extension for the Bank of England. And then we come and redevelop some time later with a building that is more fit for purpose for city uses and actually opens up new views of St Paul's Cathedral. Now, you could say, going back, how is it that you work out the criteria for building a modern building in such a historic setting? Now, there is a very good guidebook from Kay um, Council, something for Built Environment and English Heritage from 2001. And I'm not going to read out all those six guidelines. I'll let you do those. We haven't religiously followed them when we set a brief for new development projects in historic settings. But when I look back retrospectively on what has worked and what has worked less well, the truth is, if you tick those boxes, it probably works. So I think it's one of those very smart lists that you try and keep with you. And we've had a scheme in Exeter, and you can see bottom right, it's a retail scheme in open street format that runs virtually through to the cathedral. And that scheme, I think, really does work new building, historic context. But I've got an admission to make. Um, its success is not down to us. Uh, we were proposing a redevelopment uh, with a covered shopping mall that would have eliminated various streets. And the local people said no, and CABE said no, and the local authority listened to those two stakeholder groups and said no to us. So we went again, away, started again, and came up with something which really did work. And English Heritage, I think, actually wrote a monologue about it being an example of how to build new in a historic context. So I've used the word street. Streets are very important. And in London, we're lucky because we have an interesting street pattern. Increasingly, if I, not as a doing a job, but go on holiday to cities, I would say a lot of the success of cities is down to streets. It isn't particularly building elevations. It's getting streets right. And another example, here in Cambridge, top left is what used to be on the site, Georgian building, 
really probably supporting colleges. Top right, you can begin to see the college on the left-hand side, on the other side of the street. That looks to me like a 1930s redevelopment to provide a more efficient shop unit on what is actually a shopping street, despite it having a college in. <coughs> Disaster struck in the 1960s, bottom right, with a scheme, and I'm afraid it's, I can only get a photo from the back end, but what it does, that's where the street was, and the street has disappeared, and it's been replaced by an arcade, going, a retail arcade going through the middle. <coughs> so we've lost the texture of the street pattern within the city. Bottom left, we thought better about our building, redeveloped it. Not only have we reinstated the street, but little things like the building has a cutback to open up the views of the college. So that's another example of trying to, perhaps unconsciously, hit some of those guidelines set by CAVE and English Heritage. Now, I've talked a lot about buildings that work and buildings that don't work. How on earth do you articulate that? Well, Stephen Bailey, who was the founder of the Design Museum, came up with this wonderful statement. A good building is one that makes you feel better, and a bad building is one that makes you feel worse. And actually, if you walk around the city, you'll probably find this works pretty well. What I'm slightly unsure of is, is it a relative test or an absolute test? So is it the new building that you put up is better than the one it replaces, or is it an absolute test? And here in Canterbury, we replaced the building on the left with a building on the right. And I think we met that test in relative terms. I don't actually think we met it in absolute terms. I don't think that quite is a building that makes you feel better, literally, as you walk through it. So I'll move on to uh, a vista that's quite well known in London. So Victorian Bankman taking in the Houses of Parliament. My view is that the best building in, in, along that street is not the Houses of Parliament. The background to the Houses of Parliament is that there was an architectural competition. They selected the architect, and the architect opened what was a bit like a wallpaper sample book. And he said, you can have a Georgian version, or you can have a Gothic version. And they picked the Gothic version. It really isn't great in terms of context. But actually, for me, the best building is that one, which is Portcullis House, designed by Sir Michael Hopkins. We can go to a less smart street. Let's go to Soho. Berwick Market, you can just see them putting up the stalls there for the street market that runs down the street. For me, the best building in that street is a modern building. And, and this, these things are really quite important because it does matter that people are able to have an ambition to really succeed in delivering good buildings. Politics. <coughs> Project development is affected by politics, and sometimes that politics is low-key, and at the moment, with the draft national planning policy framework, it's not low-key, it's on the front page of the Telegraph regularly. And less high profile, there's a government consultation paper out at the moment about whether there should be a chain, an automatic change of use allowed from certainly offices and perhaps industrial space to residential. Now, I'm going to set some context for those two proposed government policies. First, national planning policy framework. Currently, planning guidelines and regulations are set out in a bit over a thousand pages. This document, the draft, is 52 pages long. Now, we say to our shareholders that the planning system in the UK is so unpredictable, so costly, so time consuming, that it's a barrier to entry. It shouldn't be the aspiration of any government that they have set up a system that creates barriers to entry for business. The point about change of use from offices to residential. We have in the UK NIMBYism. It was quite interesting, I was talking to somebody recently um, who, for whom 
English is their um, native tongue, but they didn't know what NIMBYism is because they don't come from Britain. And we, NIMBYism clearly is where people don't want uh, others building houses close to their own. To give you a flavour as to how uh, influential NIMBYism has been in the UK, the planning system came in, I think, 1947 in the UK. Let's take the period from 1953 to 2010. That's 57 years. The growth in house prices over that period is 8,000%. So, a good investment. The growth in commercial property values over that period is 800%. Now, actually, there's a bit of compounding in there. So, if you compound it, it's not quite as dramatic the difference. But there's a very big difference. What that means is the UK planning system has been capable of delivering enough commercial floor space to accommodate the growth of businesses in the UK, it has totally failed to deliver enough homes to accommodate growth in population without enormous asset price inflation. The, I'll say a few words about the growth agenda. Now, controversial subject is the government spending too much time on managing the cost side of the public sector and not enough on growth. What I would say as a business person is that when budgets are squeezed, you do have to really focus on the cost side because it is within your control. The revenue side, which is taxes and economic growth, you can try and help, but you don't totally control the outcome. But this getting growth right does matter because the solution to the public sector deficit is to have tax revenues growing quicker than public sector expenditure by 4% per annum for five years. So it, there, it's two sides of the equation that gets us to the right point. And property investment, property development, because it's so capital intensive, really can make a contribution to growth. Big capital projects generate an awful lot of employment. Since January 2010, Land Securities has started, I'm guessing, about eight to 10 development projects with a, a cost of about 1.7 billion pounds. Those projects support 14,000 jobs on construction sites and in related manufacturing plants. We ourselves employ 700 people. So a company of 700 people making investment decisions that support 14,000 jobs. So capital investment is absolutely critical. Now, you could say, why on earth have I, a property developer, got immigration and a third runway at Heathrow Airport on the list of political issues relevant to us? Well, I recently gave a talk on the future of cities. And my first two points about the success of London as a city were about immigration and Heathrow Airport. And it's all about making sure that you have an open society, which is open from an international perspective. There's been a lot of work done about successful cities globally across the world. And increasingly, the view is that the successful cities are those which attract talented people from overseas. We've had recently within this country cutbacks on immigration. Similarly, a successful country or a successful city will need a great international connectivity to the fastest growing countries around the world. We have one hub airport, it no longer has the capacity to add additional routes to the countries which are growing quickest. So these things really matter. But I suspect what happens is, when you're in a difficult economic environment, politicians play to the local or domestic concerns of their electorate. It is a much more difficult environment for them to make those tough decisions that support long-term economic growth, which for me is what immigration and potentially a third runway at Heathrow Airport are all about. Now, to close, Broadgate in the City of London. This is a scheme which was constructed incredibly rapidly after deregulation of financial services in the City of London, and it enabled 
the city to accommodate rapidly growing businesses or businesses from overseas choosing to grow in London. So it met the criteria that I talked about. But it did more than that. It's been a well-designed building with great open spaces that are popular and wonderful routes through it, so permeability. And it was appropriate that last year there was a lot of controversy about whether this building should or should not be listed. But I think it's a great tribute to the developer to have a debate about the listing of what was a speculative development scheme. I'm very happy to take your questions. Well, thank you very much indeed, Francis, for an erudite and condensed uh, tour of the subject. Um, you mentioned the uh, draft national planning policy framework as being controversial. Add to the headlines that I was sent a cutting from the Washington Post this morning. It's the front page of the Washington Post as well. Uh, the, the irony is that as a large developer, um, I happen to study land economy with Fiona Reynolds, who now runs the National Trust. So it's interesting how, for some of you in the room, how the same course can lead to rather different outcomes. <laughs> Very nice irony. Anyway, um, questions, please. Can you, can you say who you are, just yes. as a general interest? Um, my name's Paul Hudson. I'm no longer of any fixed academic opponent, as they say in the criminal court proceedings. Um, I'm sorry that I arrived uh, five minutes late. I didn't uh, catch the first part of your talk. There's a number of comments that I wanted to make. The first concerns cost. I'd like to put the proposition to you, and this is based on talking to um, uh, professors of civil engineering. Their contact with architects, particularly in this country, is they have very little understanding of engineering principles, probably because their mathematical competence is almost uh, non-existent. For example, if we take the Millennium Dome, you can look at a book by Van der Lewis, she holds a chair in civil engineering at uh, Warwick University. In that um, book, she mentions, in fact, a complete ignorance on the part of the architects of tensions, torques, and stresses and this increased the cost no end. Similar arguments also apply in the same book um, as regards the Millennium Bridge. Another example, when I was uh, teaching in Australia, an architecture prize was awarded to a particular student there. The professor of architecture took it to one of the professors of civil engineering. He said, what do you think of this? And after five minutes, the professor of civil engineering said it would fall down within a, you know, months of it being constructed. So I think that's a major source of problems, and I'm just wondering whether there's something amiss, in fact, with developers choosing uh, architects who may have big names, but don't necessarily have the appropriate engineering competence. They're usually getting contracts, it seems to me. I shall mention no names in order to protect the guilty. They have very good teams of lawyers who can run circles around local authority lawyers. As regards immigration that you mentioned, I speak of somebody who's been an immigrant in two other countries myself. One of the things that governments don't seem to realise is that immigrants, they can bring benefits, but they can also bring stresses. For example, I live in Croydon at the moment, they cannot find places for 370 school children. And of course the effect when there's uh, crowding is that actually sends up, in fact, the prices of property. I'm not blaming the developers for anything, but they're not completely guilty of what's going wrong. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think on engineering, I would certainly agree that there are buildings which are expensive to construct. One of our skills as a commercial developer is to get the balance right between um, artistic aspiration and economical efficiency. And there's quite a lot of tension in that process. I think some of the best architects who deliver efficient buildings work very, very closely with particular firms of engineers, so there's a real rapport with them. And I think perhaps our industry is a little bit at fault sometimes because we will select separately the engineer and the architect. 
And if there isn't a good rapport, then I think you can miss out on some of those efficiencies that you've described. I think on, on the point on um, immigration, I was, um, am involved with an organization called London First, and they were, um, I think, quite bold in <coughs> lobbying some years ago for a recognition of the additional resources required by local authorities, particularly in London, where there are higher levels of, of immigration. Yes. Uh, Tony Travers from the LSE. Uh, Francis, you've touched on some of the, uh, the answer to what I'm about to ask, but um, <laughs> London's population is expected or projected to grow from about seven and three quarter million today to about nine million uh, in 2030. Now, um, unless those who are campaigning for radical changes in planning or the government's changes to planning get their way, um, a great deal of uh, development up, certainly the, nine, the growth in the population to 9 million, but possibly more than that, will be focused on London and other towns near the capital. What do you think the effect will be on the urban form of London and some of these other towns if there isn't a substantial capacity to build other than in the existing urban areas. Uh, this is the reason why I am so keen on this change of use from office or industrial to residential, um, because otherwise I can see no way in which we can free up enough land to accommodate that growth. So the patterns that I see happening are secondary business parks um, being converted to residential, some industrial estates in areas where really we now have that function being converted to industrial and a continual <coughs> intensification of density of use in the centre of London, which of course is totally dependent on public transport keeping pace. So my vision would be lots of change of use in the outer ring, and the debate has been about change of use here in central London. I don't think that's where the issue is, because to really get the volume up, it should be in, in the outer ring. More of the activity is coming, of the business activity is coming central, higher density, uh, more public transport. Yes. Christopher Hill from Line Delta Architects. Um, you made a very interesting statement um, when you said you had confidence in your abilities to manage architects to deliver, and that appears to be true. Um, do you, because you've got such skills, uh, do you consider um, bringing in smaller firms of architects that perhaps are not like Norman Foster's or something like that? Absolutely. We, we, have, we were working with a small firm called Patrick Lynch on a building of about 50,000 square feet in Victoria. Before that's even been built, we appointed them on a project of half a million square feet. So, yes. Um, that doesn't apply everywhere, but it certainly can apply. Yeah. Saw somebody over there, was Yes? Yes? <laughs> Back Hello, I'm Tony Sendifi from Queen Mary University. Um, I wanted to ask you about the National Planning Policy Framework um, and Sustainable Development. And now I think there are going to be a huge amount of change, change of use to um, one may fear unbridled development all over the country. Um, now, from a conservation point of view, I'm very concerned that although the um, planning policy framework mentions social, environmental and economic um, development, that the focus is going to be on development. Now, who do you think is going to control that ha and the, control the quality of life of the um, people who live in the buildings and, as you first mentioned rightly as a developer, 
um, you will get maximum floor space. So that seems to only continue. Who do you think, apart from the planning departments and the conservation people, are going to stop you, essentially? Um, th this document, the National Plan Planning Policy Framework, is probably a little like the work of Karl Marx. It's much talked about, it's very little read. Now, there, there are sections um, in the document which clearly state there is no change to protection of green belt, there is no change to protection of sites of special scientific interest. I think the gap that is beginning to appear is where a local authority does not have a local plan in place and a developer comes forward, the presumption would be in favour of sustainable development. Part of this sits with local authorities who haven't got local plans in place, although they're under an obligation to do so. We once developed in a town and we worked out that the last formally adopted local plan dated back to the 1960s. I think a very good uh, interim approach would be to say that for a period of two years <coughs> to allow local authorities to get local plans adopted, the presumption in favour of sustainable development should only apply to brownfield sites. Once the local plan has been adopted, it will reflect, if democracy works, the wishes of the local community because there's consultation around it. I would also have no objection if there was a statement uh, in, the, in the planning policy framework that said if a development proposal is not in accordance with the local plan, it should be refused to make that absolutely clear. So I think with very little amendment, uh, the document can be made to work in a way which would allay a lot of the concerns that have been raised here. David Kinsella. I live on uh, Lord Gadugan's patch in Chelsea. We know quite a lot about the Westminster's, Bedford's, uh, and so on, who own areas of London. Can you tell us a little bit about Lord uh, Fern? Uh, Land Securities was founded by Harold Samuel in 1944. He bought two houses in Kensington. He was a great entrepreneur. He grew through takeover activity, particularly during the 1960s. And quite a lot of the buildings that we own, the view was that Harold Samuel developed them. Actually, he didn't. He tended to buy the companies of others who had developed them. So he was more a growth through corporate takeover um, than he was. Um, th he did a certain amount of development. But, but not that much. And, and interestingly, one of the reasons I talk about um, uh, war damaged sites is he bought a company called Ravenseft that went round um, cities in the UK to help with rebuilding after the war. So the centres of Canterbury, that was a former uh, bomb damaged site, Coventry, Bristol, Exeter, and the list goes on. Hello, I'm Nick from Network Housing Group. And I just have a question about developers and the role they play on the high street. I mean, certainly we have a lot of generic high streets uh, developing. And how much of that is the fault of the developer needing to make their appraisals work, make the scheme work, that they only really go for high, high rent paying tenants? Uh, the answer to that, um, by and large, is yes, it is. But there's a bit more to it. Um, one of the difficulties in the high street is that we've seen a lot of evolution of business models. Retailers like Next, Topshop, used to trade from 1,500 square feet. They now like to trade from 10,000 square feet minimum. If you think of high streets in the UK, nearly every shop is in separate ownership and is 1,500 square feet. So the individual shop owner is not able 
to meet that requirement. In addition, a lot of the buildings are listed, and so they can't be altered sufficiently to be efficient for those users. So that's why we've seen quite a lot of sort of decline in the high street. Um, interestingly, if one landlord owns the whole of a high street, then there are many examples that they can be turned around to get an interesting mix of retailers. And we, until about a week ago, owned all the shopping in the middle of Corby. Corby is not a glamorous location, um, and we had a vacancy rate of 5%. If you were to look at the national data for towns like that, you'd expect 15 to 20%. So form of ownership has a bit to do with it in terms of keeping it vibrant. You then do get to the question about small retailers. I, I don't think small retailers should necessarily pay high rents. It won't do them any good. They should be in the slightly lesser streets. The trick then is do you create the lesser streets? In that example in Exeter, we had a street that backed onto a Roman wall. Um, and so we preserved it. And I had lunch with the leader of the council, and he said he was fed up with Clone City. What could they do for small retailers? And we committed to him to only let the shops in that particular street to regional or local retailers. And that's what we did. So there are a few examples where this happened. In London, there's a lot of examples. Go back one street from the main pitch, and you get a lot of independent smaller retailers. Um, so it can be achieved, but I think you probably need to recognise the busiest pitch of the main street probably should be for those who, who like a very high footfall and can pay the high rates. Hi, Tristan Owell, former LSE student. A um, couple of questions. Uh, the first one uh, being. Um, with regards to, you mentioned Nama owns the, uh, the Battersea Power Station and through the bank bailouts, uh, banks like RBS and Lloyds have, and ultimately the government have ended up owning large amounts of UK commercial property. Um, and there's talk, there's this West Register sort of Nama entity that's out there that is very opaque but seems to own an awful lot of commercial property. What impact has that had on the market in the UK? What distortions has that had? Um, and second question, uh, if I may, north-south divide in the UK, how do you see that um, currently and uh, any predictions for that development in the future? Right. Um, there are a lot of properties controlled by the big banks, by NAMA. A lot of them are small properties where um, some of them may not be used as we go through this cycle for the purpose for which they're currently used, they're becoming obsolete. So there is a real issue around it, which is exacerbated by the fact that the banks won't want to spend money on buildings. Commercial buildings are just like our own homes. They need love and attention and a bit of money spent on them from time to time. Um, solvent property companies do that from time to time. Banks who are looking at a, a loss and potentially getting worse tend not to. So there is an issue around that. In terms of north-south divide, um, I think we, work, we operate in a, globally in, in a global environment. So a very simple test would be what is the proportion of globally competitive businesses in the south and the north? And that will have consequences. And the public sector is a higher proportion of regional GDP in the north than it is in the south. So if the public sector cuts back, the relative impact is greater. So the government addressing the growth agenda to the extent that it can across the country, but particularly in the, in the areas um, where the cutbacks will have a relatively bigger impact, become quite important. So just one or two more questions. Uh, yes, you there, and then a couple over here. Uh, hi, Andrew Rogers um, from Schroeder Property. Um, just in regards to uh, development driving growth, um, I suppose it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario in a way because at the moment 
there's a lot of reluctance for any kind of risk appetite. So what do you think would need to change before kind of institutional investors were willing to uh, accept a kind of more high risk development approach? And then on top of that, um, where do you see the kind of debt situation going? So like in your experience, the availability of debt and the cost of debt and how you see that going forward? Development absolutely is chicken and egg um, because clearly if you get your judgments wrong um, and you build and they don't come, um, then you've lost money. So you have got to get your judgment right about demand. And I think it's at times like these, th this where developers try to get people to commit in advance to at least part of the scheme. So we are probably the only company doing much development outside London at the moment, but we've only done so where we've got occupiers to commit to quite a lot of the space in advance. I think in London you will get people being a little bit bolder and prepared to look ahead and take some comfort from the fact that after a downturn, nobody does much building for a period of two or three years. And in London, for some, large businesses, it's a bit like buying a car. Some people only buy a new car, they only go in a new building, so you always get some demand for new buildings. So if you've assessed there's no competition, you can be confident there'll be at least some demand. Um, debt, I, I might have been getting a bit more optimistic before the Euro crisis, but you'd have to say that is a setback to both availability of debt and Hi, um, Etienne Calestin, Sustainability Consultant at Knight Frank. Um, you said you believe in major refurbishments and redevelopment to achieve the carbon reduction targets. When we know that more than 70% of the existing buildings will be there in 30 years, what's your strategy to achieve the targets? And would you be willing to pay for it as a landlord? Right. Um, the targets that have been set um, based on where we are at the moment look unattainable. We will get some help from technology improvement. So all the time there are new th solutions coming through that enable you to achieve energy usage reductions <coughs> that say a year ago you thought were not achievable. Um, but there probably <coughs> has to be more that is done to change the incentivization um, to, to make it more worthwhile for building owners to invest in energy reduction improvements. Um, at the moment, we're, we're tasked to produce zero carbon new buildings by 2019. Right now, that is not achievable, full stop. People are working on it. We may get closer, but it's not achievable. Um, there is a new regulation coming in that uh, by 2018, uh, the buildings which are least energy efficient, you will not be allowed under law to re-let them. And I think very few people have quite got their mind around this yet. It will be the most enormous wake-up call that will trigger people into action. I think this should be, that's a stick, I think we need more carrots to encourage people. So perhaps differentiated level of business rates for green buildings and very energy inefficient buildings. Thank you. So, one, uh, two more. Okay, but you, uh, take you, yes, near the mic. Hi there. Um, I work in a school in East Ham that was supposed to be rebuilt under the Building Schools for the Future scheme. Uh, and unfortunately, it was cancelled um, a few years ago. Uh, what I'd like to know what your views are on that and if it was sort of relevant to commercial property developers in general. Well, 
we used to own a business that was involved in building schools for the future and we sold it. So that might answer part of your question. I think some building schools for future projects are happening and some have been very successful. I think they have been slightly caught up in the controversy around public procurement and PFI because the, the, the procurement process isn't really working for the government and it certainly isn't working for the private sector either. It's so complex it costs too much money to bid and so I'm not up to speed now on quite where Building Schools for the Future um, stands but even if we had retained ownership of that business we were going to withdraw from the market because bidding was just too expensive. It's a bit like the examples I gave on some big commercial developments. The cost up front to get yourself ready to go is, is just too high. So, a final question. Francis, a question I thought Tony Travers might ask, but uh, which, is, which is better from the point of view of developers, strong or weak local government? Oh, strong, strong local and, government. And why? Yeah. Uh, for um, the bigger development schemes, we absolutely do not develop on our own. Um, it involves liaison with local authorities about changes to road patterns, about so many other things. And there's always a reason that you can say no to a development process. It's complicated, you can always have an issue with it. We are attracted by local authorities who have a strong vision for what they want to achieve to the extent that on occasion we've been to local councils who've expressed interest in something happening in, in, in a city and um, we have concluded that they just haven't got the clarity of vision and strength of purpose to make it happen and we have withdrawn. We've said we don't want to tie up four of our best people for four years going nowhere. So it really matters to us. Yeah. Well, on that very decisive <laughs> note, uh, draw the edge uh, to close. And thank you very much for the, uh, both for your talk and for uh, being patient and responsive to the questions. Thank you.